Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. One of the strangest aspects of the way America looks at the Middle East is the way that some here have decided to try to understand the century-old conflict between Jews and Arabs as merely a new chapter in the very American conflict about civil rights. American ideas about the Middle East, whether from those who supported Israel and Zionism or those who opposed them, have always had a lot more to do with the obsessions and interests of Americans than the realities of the conflict and the Middle East. But in the last year, as ideas about intersectionality and white privilege have gone mainstream with the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, the notion that the Palestinian war against Zionism must be understood as not merely being related to the battles being fought about civil rights in the United States, but actually taking place largely along the same lines with oppressed indigenous people of color resisting the depredations of those possessing white privilege. By this intellectual magic act, Israeli Jews were transformed from being the scattered remnants of a Jewish people that had suffered 20 centuries of persecution brought back to their ancestral home, where they struggled to survive against the hatred of the Arab and Islamic worlds, into a white colonial elite, practicing their own brand of apartheid. And in doing so, Israel's critics were able to depict the latest fighting with Hamas in May as a mythic story in which terrorists shooting rockets into Israeli towns and cities were transformed into the iteration, into the uh, embodiment of George Floyd, and Israelis as a nation of Derek Chauvin's pressing their knees down on the neck of an oppressed people. That's the only way to understand why the May conflict resulted in not only a torrent of opprobrium directed at Israel, but a justification for a rising global tide of anti-Semitism that, for the first time in living memory, resulted in attacks on Jews in the streets of American cities and not just on those of European capitals. How do we account for this disturbing trend and its acceptance not only by Western intellectual elites, but also many Jews who have embraced these formulations and often the anti-Zionist cause itself? With us this week to discuss these and other questions is one of the more astute observers of the Jewish scene, author and journalist, Liel Leibovitz. Well, Leibovitz is an editor-at-large at Tablet Magazine and the co-host of its podcast, Unorthodox. He's the author of several books, included, including spiritual biographies of Leonard Cohen and Stan Lee. A veteran of the Israel Defense Forces, he now lives in Manhattan with his wife and children. Okay, Lil, uh, you recently wrote in Commentary Magazine about the classification of Jews as whites and the implications of that. How did this weird transposition of Jews come about, do you think? You know, first of all, I think the, the, the key point to remember is precisely the word that you just used, which is, which is the more juste, as we say in Yiddish. It's just weird. I mean, if you look at uh, a, a whole host uh, of, of, of a nation that includes, you know, Moroccan Jews and Yemeni Jews and Ethiopian Jews, along with Russian Jews and Israeli Jews, who are by themselves, you know, a separate category, to insist uh, that this is white, uh, that we are white in, in, in any way, uh, is, is just kind of bizarre, uh, which leads you to try and look at, uh, at this problem through this, through this criterion of trying to figure out what exactly is going on here. And, and I think the only kind of fair and reasonable explanation uh, is that uh, anti-Semites have always taken pleasure as defining Jews to be the answer to whatever problem they thought were plaguing their society. So if you're a communist, uh, Jews were the moneylenders. You know, if you're a radical uh, nationalist, Jews were the other. If you're obsessed with some kind of, uh, you know, progressive replacement theology death cult, as so much of the, of the radical left is these days, then obviously Jews are the one thing that is uh, construed as most sinful and most horrible, which is the quote-unquote uh, white people, uh, which in of itself is the preposterous category created mainly by, you know, German kooks in the late 19th century, interested in all kinds of ideology that, you know, thankfully, the rest of us sane humans have, have long uh, abandoned. Yeah, I mean, that sort of race 
was that race was the obsession of intellectuals a century or more ago. Correct. Um, even even respectable, nice people thought in terms of race. Um, people we even honor. I mean, people like Churchill even sometimes spoke about races a lot. Um, we supposedly got beyond that, but now we're right back in it. And indeed, it's now the sine qua non. It's 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 the total way to define everything. And certainly. As critical race theory intersectionality has gone mainstream, that seems to to be you know it, it seems the natural step. Okay, now where do where what do we call Jews that we fit them in there? Well, thankfully we have a much better answer, uh, and we always had, and and our answer uh, you know gracefully informed. Uh, everything uh, from the creation of this nation up until, historically speaking, five minutes ago. You know, uh, my my dear friend Rabbi Dr. Ari Lam likes to say that the Hebrew Bible is every bit America's founding moral document, as the Constitution is our founding political document. Uh, and the Hebrew Bible gives us a very clear understanding of how to look at all these issues, uh, especially you know uh, racial inequality, which is why. When you listen to every single American uh, who had fought the good fight on this issue of race, from Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth to uh, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, etc., they all spoke in words that, that make no sense uh, and, and are not uh, understandable unless you are firmly rooted in the tradition of the Hebrew Bible. And Martin Luther King said, you know, I have been to the mountaintop. Which mountaintop do you think he's talking about? And, and where is he <laughs> taking that language? Now, the problem uh, began when uh, a, a, a radical new tradition, a competing tradition, a non-American and indeed anti-American tradition came along and said, no, these concepts are flawed. We're going to replace them with something very different, something predicated on power, something predicated on, on this kind of uh, inversion of, of the pyramid of the relationship between uh, races real and imagined on uh, quasi-scientific and, and academic notions, this would have been uh, an atrocity that, that would have been unrecognizable to people like Frederick Douglass or Martin Luther King. And it's uh, their tradition, which is indeed our tradition, that we need to defend. Yeah, I think that goes quite to the heart of all these battles about the New York Times and its 1619 project and critical race theory, which is now, you know, a, a battle line, you know, that's it's a battlefront in school boards and editorial boards. Um, you know, who's America? Whose vision of America do we embrace? And um, it seems as if certainly since last summer and the moral panic about race that seemed to sweep over the country, at least in terms of the chattering classes, after the death of George, George Floyd, um, it seems that we've, we, it, there, there's a necessity to throw everything out. It's not just toppling the statues of Confederates, which is you know certainly defensible. It's, it's everything. It's questioning everything about American history. The anthem, the flag, the you name it. Um, and on the one hand, people think, well, it's just old bad stuff, but it really has an impact on how we view not only ourselves and our basic ideas about liberty, but also it, it impacts the Jews, doesn't it? I think it impacts the Jews, uh, you know, widely and widely. Uh, I, I take only the, the most minor uh, issue with, with the way you, you phrase the question. I don't think it's whose version of America is going to emerge triumphant. I think it is a question of whether or not we still want to have an America or we want to replace it with something that may still go by the same name and share many of the same symbols and institutions, but will be uh, unrecognizable if you actually look at, at the founding principles of this nation in which the Jews have had uh, a, a tremendous or played a tremendous part uh, showing up, uh, building and informing not just uh, by giving this great nation uh, a host of its most treasured symbols uh, from I'm dreaming of a white Christmas uh, to, you know, so many Supreme Court justices, but also, as I said before, by, by really um, uh, bequeathing uh, to the founding fathers these religious foundational principles without which this country is, is indistinguishable. But I want to bring it uh, a little bit back uh, to, to our current moment 
and start to propose a, a sort a sort of way out, if you will. Uh, w when you hear these discussions, uh, these these gripes, forget the uh, proven historical falsities perpetrated by Nicole Hannah Jones and the 1619 Project, which by now have been debunked as you know absolute nonsense. But but when you hear uh, many times many well-meaning people saying, well, you know, don't you believe in, in, in equity? Uh, the answer, I think, especially from Jews, must be no. I do not believe mm -hmm. in equity. I believe in excellence, which is precisely the principle that has enabled not only Jews, but also, and I speak now as an immigrant to this country, so many of us who came here looking for a better life to thrive and to find opportunities and to find meaning and to find precisely the type of life that we sacrifice so much to have. It is, again, foundational to what America is, and it's foundational to what it must remain, if it is to remain America. Well, that's a very important perspective that you're bringing to it, because as someone who came to this country and um, seemingly has a, has a greater appreciation of sort of the virtues of, uh, you know, life, liberty, you know, in the pursuit of happiness, you know, a, a happiness that you're supposed to go out and chase yourself rather than just hand it to you and the idea of equality of opportunity, not equity and, and equality of, of, of outcome. Um, the truth is the vast majority of American Jews are now the grandparent, you know, the grandchildren or the great grandchildren or the great great grandchildren of, of, of most of the immigrants who came to this country and you know, from, from Eastern Europe. That, that, that's the biggest number of of immigrants who came in the late 19th and late 19th and early 20th century, and really do think of themselves as you know the old Milton Helmer Farb line about Jews, um, you know, living like Episcopalians and voting like Puerto Ricans. Um, that doesn't even have any you know that that quip doesn't even have any resonance for them because number one they don't even know who the Episcopalians are. Uh, the wasps <laughs> have you know pretty much been the wasps aren't the wasps anymore. And, you know, it's, they do see themselves. I mean, getting back to my first question to you about how do Jews become whites, a lot of Jews see themselves in that way. They, they because, you know, I, either they have lost any sense of their own sense of Jewish peoplehood um, as being coming from someplace else or having a separate identity, but see themselves as privileged people and feel impelled by what they see as, you know, as Jewish tradition of social justice to embrace anything that helps, you know, what they see as the underdog. Uh, and, and that's how they get into it. So they're willing to do it. They're willing to go along with it. Gosh, Jonathan, But clearly you have a different perspective. I mean, gosh, you know, if only there was some kind of historical example of what happened when Jews stopped seeing themselves as Jews and began viewing themselves as cosmopolitans committed to some world order, that always ends up well, right? We always convince <laughs> others that we're truly righteous and, and wonderful and no historical consequence ever befalls us, right? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like the story of George Soros' father, who was a champion of Esperanto, um, you know, the, the universal language. And it's like, no, we're not really Jews anymore. But, you know, then the next thing they do, they're, they're hiding from the Nazis in, in, in Budapest. But, uh, and then miraculously, yeah, I, I, returning right to the idea... That if only the entire world was this nice little oyster, every and if only we Jews sort of championed this this sense of you know universalism, then, then all would be right for the world, and, and the Mashiach would come, uh, and anti-Semitism mm -hmm. would perish. Uh, if it wasn't actually hurting real live Jews, and and usually not the ones who espouse these these silly ideas, it would be comical. Yeah, but of course, that's the whole point. The reason why it became, you know, the, the, the fighting between Israel and Hamas became such a focal point is that the, you know, the, the whole advance of the BLM movement and critical race has kind of transformed some of the discussion about Israel in ways that I think even some of us who've been following this didn't realize that if you go back to 2014, the last big flare up, um, which was a much more, you know, many more casualties and in, in many ways a very difficult uh, story to follow. Um, this time the, the opprobrium was much higher. The invective was, was worse. There were more people, more prominent people, more people in public life 
celebrities as well as members of uh, of Congress willing to denounce Israel in terms that relate to this whole critical race, you know, way of looking at the world and to demonize it in ways that I think a lot of us, a lot, I took a lot of liberals by, by surprise. Well, let me, let me say something uh, that, that, that may surprise you. I'm glad, I'm genuinely glad that this happened uh, because I, I hope uh, sincerely that this uh, would, would help uh, many of us who have been living under uh, the false uh, assumption that if only you explained your position correctly about Israel, everyone will see, if not the rightness of our ways, at the very least, the complexity of the conflict. Enough with all that. If Zionism has taught us one thing, and one thing only, is that we thrive uh, precisely when, when we understand the very simple and very painful um, notion that there are uh, very real enemies out there in the world who wish us harm, and that therefore, rather than uh, beg for their sympathy and understanding, we ought to go about our own way, defending ourselves and serving our own interests. When we do this, we thrive, we grow strong, uh, and we grow prosperous. When we don't, we perish because none of these coalitions with our so-called friends uh, have ever lasted very long. So let all those who have spent years sort of, you know, dancing uh, on, on, on the pin of a needle, kind of saying like, well, you know, I support Israel. It's the occupation, uh, whatever that is, that I oppose. Or you can be anti-Zionist, but not anti-Semitic, as if opposing to the existence of the world's sole Jewish state is somehow not a blatant anti-Semitic act. Let all these people... Uh, lay down their presumptions and, and, their, and their false narratives. Let them come out as exactly what they are. And, and let the Jews, sadly, finally, uh, urgently, pick sides. Uh, it's us and them. It sounds very stark, and I say this not with an, not with an ounce of uh, jubilation. Uh, I wish uh, we were living in a reality that left plenty of room for, for nuance and complexity. Uh, however, we're not. And therefore, I think this is a tremendously clarifying moment. And the solution is, as it has always been, uh, do for yourself, stand with your people, protect the Jews. Uh, and as, as we have since the beginning of recorded history, uh, we'll try it. I, I think that's, a, that's an important point. And I think you, you pointed out in a recent uh, piece in, in Tablet that it really does come down to Zionism versus anti-Zionism. Um, that that's the only, and, and I think that's, Clearly true. I think you know it's not about territories. It's not about settlements. It's is there you know do do you support the existence of a Jewish state or don't you? But of course, one of the interesting things about American Jewry in 2021 is that an increasingly large number of Jews. um, I think we tend to try to poo poo it because it doesn't sound nice. It makes us unhappy are actually coming down on the side of the anti-Zionists. And it's not just, you know, members of groups like If Not Now and Jewish Voices for Peace who are anti-Zionist and at times, you know, enabling anti-Semitic tropes. But there is a broad, um, you know, there's a much broader, you know, constituency within American Jewry that is kind of drifting away from, you know, even lip service towards Zionism. And I might suggest that that might be more, you know, be more in keeping with the history of, of the American Jewish community, which was, you know, originally not terribly Zionist un- until 1940. Well, I, I want to um, I, look, even though I'm no longer an academic, uh, I've been in academia long enough to, to still, you know, maintain some of the virus in my blood. So let me, <laughs> let me use a, a, an academic language and say that, that I want to complicate your question, right? Academics always have to complicate things, never, never solve any real problems for any real people. Uh, so look, I, I spent, or at least spent uh, before the, the, the current plague upended so much uh, of our lives, I, I spent a tremendous amount of my time traveling uh, from, from one Jewish community to another and, and, and talking to, to people and really tra- sort of trying to take the pulse uh, of the community. I'd like to share uh, with you what I've seen. Uh, undoubtedly, there is a sizable minority uh, of people, and, and sadly, if, if I had to characterize them, I would say the majority of them are younger, the majority of them are, uh, shall we say, overly educated, uh, or poorly educated, to use the correct term, by which I mean to say people with graduate degrees. 
um, who, who take exactly these positions, uh, who have been sort of indoctrinated into the worldview that, uh, that Israel and all forms of, of, of other people's national uh, feelings and religious feelings are bad. Uh, however, I don't think that's the majority of American Jews. I think the majority of American Jews are actually in a far more complicated position. I think um, they are living uh, in a time in which all of the old structures, if you will, uh, all of the edifices that we have erected about 100 years ago uh, to help make sense of, of the sort of intricate needs of our communal life have for one reason or another stopped being relevant. I mean, up until not too long ago, uh, life was easy, communally speaking, right? Communal Jewish life was easy. You belonged to a shul. You uh, supported the Federation in its annual campaign. Uh, you gave money to Hadassah, the ADL, both, and a host of other organizations. And they, in turn, sort of did a lot of the work for you. So you could just nominally say, yes, I'm Jewish, and I'm part of this, and I'm contributing, and this is, this is my life. Um, for a whole host of reasons, I suspect, much too complex to, to get into now, Many, although by no means all of these organizations, have stopped being relevant to the way a lot of people actually live their lives. And some of them had made, uh, like the ADL, for example, have made uh, uh, you know, regrettable decisions to become uh, partisan advocacy organizations rather than representing the real needs of mm -hmm. Jews, which is what the Anti-Defamation League under Jonathan Greenblatt today is doing. Uh, but that leaves a vast swath of American Jews Sort of confused because these are these are you know dentists and lawyers and teachers uh, and 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 accountants. These are not people who uh, saw their job as ever being you know politics or community building or or anything kind of you know uh, in, intricate uh, and time consuming such as this. And now I think they're simply at a loss as for who they could trust, uh, which is why they gravitate uh, to to new and to, to new forms that are still busy being born. Uh, some of it is to podcasts, some of it is to little chavurot, little groups of people who study together, uh, some of it is to online communities. I am tremendously optimistic because I think all the energy is there and I actually think that the vast majority of American Jews completely feel the right things, think the right things, have the real uh, sense of simple pride and joy of, of belonging to the Jewish people and simple pride and joy, which is not to say uncritical pride and joy, in the state of Israel, they're just looking for new and better ways to express these sentiments. Well, that's that's that, that sounds great. great. I apologize um, for my audience. But of course, I, I hope it's permitted. No, 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 no need to. I mean, um, those of us who who write and think in the Jewish world, like like a lot of those people who work for federations and stuff. I mean, we we all shrug a vault for a living, um, and yet you know the Jewish people survive, and and we have to have faith in that. However, I mean. In a community where the fastest growing group of Jews is, you know, what the demographers call Jews of no religion, the decline of faith has an impact on all of this, doesn't it? I mean, and I think that's something you've commented on, that without faith, without, you know, it's, it's very hard to, to pull this off. It's very hard to maintain a sense of peoplehood. Um, and it's very easy to drift into, you know, thinking of yourself as just another white American with privilege, you know, with whose, you know, parents and grandparents, uh, you know, were, were more prosperous than other people, isn't it? It is, but, 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 but I don't necessarily agree with, with, this, with this assertion about the, the decline of faith. I think uh, when, when so many respondents uh, answer uh, that they don't really have, you know, that they don't really belong to, to any specific organized religious tradition, in many senses, that's because, well, you know, they're a little bit at a loss. If I'm, for example, a non-Orthodox Jew, right, and, and I, I go to the same shul that, uh, you know, my family's always gone to, but now uh, the rabbi, instead of talking about, you know, the weekly Parsha, is giving me some watered-down version of whatever the social justice talking point du jour happens to be. And I, I feel... The Democratic Party platform exactly. with holidays. And, and I feel it, like, yeah. even if I agree with this, I feel like, why am I wasting my time here? This is not something that's meaningful to me. And then I'm kind of in a wilderness, and, and I'm inclined to say, well, yeah, I don't participate. But, but I want to tell you a story uh, on the flip side of this, and I, I, I hope that it will come across not, not as a bit of, of sort of rank self-promotion, uh, but rather as, as you know, in, in the spirit of, of sort of awe and joy that, that, I, that I intend to convey the story. You're allowed to self-promote uh, a little bit. A year so. and a half ago, 
uh, on on a Thursday afternoon, I um, I caught wind uh, that the weekly that the rather uh, annual seven and a half year long cycle of Dafiomi reading one page of Talmud a day uh, was coming to to its end, and that this the Siyum Hashas is going to happen. People are going to congregate 90 something thousand of them uh, in giant stadium uh, and and celebrate this thing and so uh, being someone interested like yourself in, in podcasting uh, I, I called uh, my boss Alana Newhouse a tablet and said hey you know it's Thursday they're concluding the cycle on on Sunday how about on Monday when they're beginning again how about we launch a new uh, daily podcast it's only a seven and a half year commitment I'm asking for I mean talk about job security right uh, yeah. I, I, I want to do this. I want to do a daily Dafniomi podcast. And Alana, to her immense credit, said, sure, yeah, go ahead. Uh, and when I started this, uh, it, it is called Take One. Uh, and when I started this podcast, I thought that, you know, this would appeal to uh, a handful of people who think Talmud is interesting. Uh, because I assumed, uh, like the premise of your question, that the, the majority of Jews are sort of uh, you know, shying away from, from all form of serious religious engagement. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to spend some time with two or 300 people who actually are interested in this thing? Uh, I, I won't uh, be boastful and, and share with you the, the numbers that we have received for this podcast in the year and a half since, uh, but they are much, 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 much larger than that. Uh, and I don't think it's because we have any real talent uh, necessarily. I think it's because there is a real... And, and tremendously inspiring thirst uh, for exactly this, for real Yiddishkeit, for real learning, for real engagement with Jewish texts, with Jewish religion, with Jewish tradition. People really want to connect. They may not do it in, in, in yay olden ways. They may not do it in the pews of congregation Ahavat Achim or whatever it is, right, where their family mm-hmm. used to go. They may do it in a podcast. They may do it in, in, a, in a little group like Another example I would give a couple weeks ago, it's 3.30 on a Friday afternoon. I get a text from my friend Max, who is, you know, a, a high-powered law professor at NYU, not exactly where you would expect to find some Yiddish scholars, saying to me, we are starting a new group every Friday afternoon. A few of us non-religious, quote-unquote, Jews, we're getting together, we're studying Mishnah. You're in? We're doing it over Zoom. This is so incredible and it, it's i think these are things that would you know you would not have seen or heard even seven or, or ten years ago and they're an indication that those quote-unquote jews without religion are very much jews with the, the old timey jewish religion they're just finding brand new exciting ways to plug into it you know i think that's an important point about that you know jewish life has a way of you know, popping back when we least expect it. Um, and the Jewish people are more resilient than we expect. Um, but one of the interesting things is right now, you know, there's been much more emphasis on anti-Semitism, and certainly what happened in the last couple of months has focused people on that. But it seems as if, and, and I think, again, you, you, you bring this kind of outsider's, you know, perspective on it, it seems to me that most American Jews are still much more interested in fighting sort of the partisan, you know, tribal culture wars of Republicans and Democrats, Trump and anti-Trump, than focusing on sort of a broad uh, agenda of uh, combating anti-Semitism. We saw so-called unity rally a couple of weeks ago in Washington, which, you know, despite the best, you know, noble intentions seemed to be something of a flop. Um you know, there, 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 there seems to be stronger pulls on American Jewish loyalties than um, fear of anti-Semitism or even concern about it. Do, do you agree with oh, that? Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, again, I, I don't think this is necessarily a, a new phenomenon. You, you need only to look at mm-hmm. uh, Stalin's Yidsektia, right, Yidsektia, to, to know that the attempt to sort of uh, recruit court Jews as, as a sort of, you know, a, a front to whatever political or partisan uh, cause you, you wanted to promote is, is, is hardly new. Uh, I think it is, it is extremely important uh, not only to, to avoid these pratfalls, uh, by which I don't mean to say that we should remain uh, completely sort of uh, neutral or bipartisan. I think very frequently, especially sadly recently, uh, you know, events uh, call for, for Jews to take you know, clear stances uh, in favor or against uh, this political party or or that, uh, but I think that the focus ought to be 
not just fighting anti-Semitism, which, which honestly, you know, for, for all of its uh, menace, uh, I think is still a, a, a secondary concern. I, I think the concern should really be, and, and apologies for sounding, you know, somewhat more bearded uh, than I actually am in real life here, but the concern should be about uh, keeping alive those Jewish values that have kept us alive since the beginning of time. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the energy should go to studying Torah. The energy should go to, to engaging in Jewish texts. They should go in, to engaging in mitzvot, in Jewish life. Um, do that. And all the other palms sort of fall by the wayside. Again, this is, this is not just a, a kind of spiritual calling. If, if you sort of study history closely, uh, you would see that it has a very strange way of, of, of correlating with, with the welfare of the Jewish people. When we are focused on the right things, we thrive. When we're focused on on, on the on, on worldly nourishment, uh, we stumble and fall. That's true. I think that is uh, that would be a hard position to argue against. Um, and yet, um, I, I think as much as you would say that there is you know a, a rebirth of Jewish life in, in unusual ways. Um, yet a lot of Jews don't seem that terribly interested, you know, in that they, they really are more interested in their own political and their own secular, uh, mindset. Um, but, um, you know, that, it still leaves us wondering, you know, how do we reach, you know, Jews who are so removed from, from Jewish life, from, you know, a generation or two away from, you know, any contact with ideas about mitzvot and Jewish law and Jewish study, let alone Torah, um, that's, 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 a, that, that's a real problem. And of course, American Jews have been chasing their tails about this for the last 30 years since the first, you know, sort of uh, devastating demographic studies came out in 1990, um, talking about Jewish education in camps and trips to Israel. And yet, it doesn't really seem to have moved the the needle that much in terms of uh, how people are actually behaving or living. Absolutely. And I, th I think, look, in, in, in many ways, and, and again, these are way too complicated subjects with, with way too many exceptions to do justice uh, to, but, but sort of briefly put, I think a huge part of the problem is that Jews did what Jews always do, which is assume that the great good is elsewhere, right? How do we make, uh, how do we bring people to shul? We make shul cool. We have singles night. We have, you know, how do, how do we bring people to shul? We make shul cool. We have movie night and uh, singles parties and all these events with speakers. And we do social justice things, et cetera, et cetera. And we're political and we're engaged and we're involved. Um, why? Because I can't get a good movie or a place to find a date in Manhattan that I have to go to my synagogue. I can't find another opportunity to socialize with other Jews that I need to go to this officially sanctioned thing. I mean, we've tried everything, everything, except for actually presenting the thing in of itself as it is. I think that the, the strategy should be very, very simple and very, very blunt. Guys, we're not trying to sell you anything. We have an amazing, to use a very crass language here, we have an amazing product here. It's right here. If you want it, it is yours to take because it's yours by right. And, and, and here's a, a sort of a, a, a real world explanation. Here's sort of a real world uh, proof that this approach works. Look at what Hillel is doing on campuses and look at what Chabad is doing on campuses. You know, Chabad is by far, by far the ascending force on campuses, even though Hillel has all these mighty budgets and traditions and structures and organizations. That's because Hillel, again, with many exceptions, too often uh, the Hillel houses are, the Hillel chapters too often are busy sort of like playing all these like games of like, oh, we need to live at a campus and do politics and, and team up with these people and those people. And what, what, what happens if we say this or say that? And it just becomes this kind of intricate, exhausting, tiring thing. Whereas you come to a Chabad house on campus, they say, you know what, you know what we want? We want for you to have a l'chaim and have a nice Shabbos meal. That's it. You're interested? Okay, well, there's, you know, Shachris tomorrow morning. You could come and pray with us. But we're not trying to sell you anything. We're just here to show you how joyous we are with this amazing heritage that we have. And if you want part on this, uh, of this thing, we're happy to have you. Crudely, uh, uh, simply put, you know, this is the principle that, that was best um, articulated by, by my great rabbi and teacher, 
Ruth Weiss, uh, someone uh, who I look up to every hour of every day. And she basically says, As do I. The, the problem is that too often Jews act like, you know, the cool kids are sitting at, at, you know, two tables over. We need to start acting like the table where we're sitting, that's the cool kids table. The party is right here. And by the way, it's a very inclusive party and everyone's welcome. And if you don't want to come to it, that's fine. We're not here to waste millions of dollars try and get you to come to our cool party because that's not what cool parties are about. We're here. We're super proud. We're super joyous. This is the absolute best place to be. We'd ra- There's no other place we'd rather be, not at Columbia University or Yale and not at the New York Times and not at in the White House. We want to be right here studying together with our friend, eating cholent and drinking vodka. And if you want to come in with us, we are so, so happy to have you. And if you don't, that's fine too. That's the attitude that I still await some major organization that isn't Chabad to take. And as Chabad shows us, as soon as you do this, you just start winning. Mm. Very true. Leo, you, you've kind of um, gone on a journey of your own um, as a writer, um, um, as a thinker. You, you right now seem to, to um, articulate views that seem very mainstream, very pragmatic, very much in tune with sort of what seems to be like a, a consensus in Israel about, about politics or about you know, these sort of existential questions about peace processes. Uh, how did you? Where, where, how did you come? You know, you're 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 an Israeli. You come to the United States. Tell me about how you have evolved in your own thinking um, to to get to the point where you are this uh, person advocating tradition and advocating some you know some very sensible moderate policies. I mean, is this how you've always kind of approached it, or is is, is you know is is there something else that's going on? Well, first of all, Jonathan, of- uh, you know. Were all my admiration for you. It, it was worth it coming on the show just to hear you describe me as sensible. I will, I will use that line with my wife frequently. <laughs> uh, my journey is, is, you know, I think simultaneously kind of, you know, strange and at the same time almost banal. Uh, I was born in Israel, the, the scion of a, of a, of a large uh, sort of, you know, respectable rabbinic family. Uh, grew up secular, or as I used to like and say it, a few cheeseburgers removed from the faith of my fathers. Uh, because while I always had faith uh, and, and a tremendous sense of pride, I always thought that, you know, being Jewish is, is almost an abstraction. Uh, because I had one, one leg uh, firmly planted in the Jewish world and the other in Western culture and civilization. And I thought that, you know, uh, since I was already a member of the Jewish club, I didn't have to do too much. I didn't have to observe or even know too much. Uh, it was time to cultivate uh, the, the, the space which was truly exciting, truly filled with opportunities and possibilities, which was, you know, the Western world. Uh, and so like, like all uh, kind of good, ambitious, young Jewish boys, I, I, I found my way to uh, the best university that would, that would admit me, Columbia University. I, um, being a, a, a full believer in, in, in justice uh, and, and everything good and nice, uh, I, I dabbled in left-wing politics because at the time they seemed extremely sensible to me. Uh, these were the early days of Oslo. I thought that it was, you know, not a bad thing uh, to give to give these accords with all the painful concessions uh, that they required uh, a fair chance. Because hey, you know, maybe the other side could could do teshuva and change, and and we could have uh, some something akin to coexistence, or at the very least, the absence of bloodshed like like we've had with Egypt. Uh, so. Supported that and, and, and chafed a little bit uh, when, when, when people who I deemed as unreasonable and irrational uh, warned, uh, as it turned out, completely frightfully, uh, that, that this is not going to end uh, very well. Uh, I got my PhD. I, I was surrounded uh, at, at all times uh, by, by people who taught what I now realize was, was a, a very narrow dogma uh, of, of, of hardened uh, progressive uh, ideology, although again, it wasn't uh, back then about 20 years ago or 15 years ago or so. Uh, it was not nearly as, as sort of uh, ossified and, and, and vile uh, as, as it is today uh, and, and, and sort of lived uh, happily until all kinds of things started happening to, to shake my, um, my faith in the system. I'll give you about one example. Uh, I had concluded my PhD at Columbia and received a, a professorship at NYU. Uh, my area of research is video games, uh, you know, hardly <laughs> sort of 
contentious political ideological arena. Uh, and one day I heard that uh, one of my colleagues was teaching a seminar about Israel and Palestine. And I was ecstatic. I was very, very happy because I thought, hey, you know, here's a topic I hadn't really thought about or written about for a while. Let's 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 get engaged. Uh, and I wrote her a note and said, hey, you know, hey, I'm this good Israeli leftist, uh, serving the idea, very proud of Israel, uh, very critical of many of the government steps. Uh, but I'm really happy that you're having the seminar. I'd like to partake. And I get an email that says, tersely, I'm really sorry. This is a closed seminar. I sort of, you know, cocked my head a little bit and, and, and looked at the screen scans and said, like, I'm sorry, I don't understand. I thought the whole purpose of what we're doing here, literally the whole reason we have this institution, is to have free and unfettered exchange of ideas about, especially if, if, if I happen to know something, or as you guys uh, in the left so, so much enjoy saying, if I have actual lived in experience that makes my contribution, you know, if, if nothing else, at least valid. Uh, and uh, regardless, I was completely barred and made to understand that if I were to remain true to these to these values of mine, uh, which are you know love for uh, the state of Israel and, and, and belief in its uh, absolute uh, uncontested right to to exist, uh, I was not welcome at the party, and and this really shook me. It, it shouldn't have. I should have been less blithe, I could, I could write it off to young age, or I could write it off to, you know, excessive idealism, but it really sort of rocked me. Uh, and, and once you sort of see that, you can't unsee it. And, and I started taking a cold, hard look at, at, the, at the academic environment around me and discovered an arena that was not committed uh, to, to inquiry, that was not committed to debate, that was committed to indoctrination, um, that was committed to uh, the sort of narrow-minded zealotry uh, that you associate with the most benighted uh, eras in, in human history. Uh, and, and that started a, a state or a process of, of, of awakening, and, and its apotheosis, if you will, was with the sad understanding that, that many of these institutions, um, in which I believed so heartily, uh, in, in whose, of, of which I wanted to be a part so badly, we're doomed uh, because um, American academia, it's not coming back uh, from, from the brink. Uh, tenure and money and other considerations have, have guaranteed its fall into the abyss of, you know, ideological lunacy. Uh, and when that happens, you, you first of all panic. And second of all, start asking yourself, okay, what has always been true? What has always been solid? What has always been an essential part of you? And the answer, the only answer that I could come up with was, well, Judaism, our tradition, who we are. Uh, and, and with that, I started to learn more and understand, as I think you can only truly understand, especially as an outsider, when you come to it at the right moment in your life, that it's not enough to just, you know, uh, be Jewish. You have to do Jewish. Uh, there's a reason we call it practicing Jew, right? Because no one ever perfects it. You have to keep on actually understanding through experience. Uh, and once I started uh, succumbing joyfully to, to this logic and really living this life, uh, I found so much depth and so much peace and so much meaning. Uh, and ever since, the only thing that I want to do is, is, is basically uh, help anyone else who may be on a similar journey. Oh, that's... That's that's a that's an important testimony there. Um, you've written a number of books, including studies of two fascinating and very different diaspora Jews, Leonard Cohen and, and Stan Lee, artists each in their own way. Um, what can you tell us, sort of on one foot, about the lives of these two very different men? Um, what does that teach us about the Jewish experience and the Jewish impact on American popular culture? And how did your own experience as an immigrant uh, from Israel impact your understanding of them and American Jews in general? Well, first of all, I think the thing that unites both of them is that they would both very much hate being called diaspora Jews. Uh, Stanley, <laughs> because, uh, you know, the creator of Marvel Comics, uh, the, the, the father of uh, so many characters that define our culture today, including, you know, Spider-Man, the X-Men, Iron Man, the Incredible Hulk, uh, the Avengers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, was a kid who grew up uh, during the Great Depression, uh, had religion, uh, you know, delivered to him almost by osmosis, uh, always felt 
that uh, it, it was, let me take it again, always felt like the, um, the pinnacle of one's achievement was to become as, as, as American uh, as could be, which is why young Stanley Lieber uh, rechristened himself, to, to use a term, as, as Stanley. And, and basically, as, as I argue in my book, sublimated all the stories of the Bible that he had heard in shul as a kid uh, into just, you know, thinly veiled uh, and caped inventions. Uh, for example, looking at this notion of what happens uh, with, with when you have great power, uh, but not yet understand your great responsibility, uh, which is a, an issue that has plagued everyone from Cain to Spider-Man. Uh, it's about what, what happens when you fail to understand that you are your brother's keeper and that you must take the powers that God gave you and, and, and use them uh, for, for good. And so that, I think, was, was Stan Lee's uh, trajectory. Leonard Cohen, on the other hand, uh, grew up as, as a sign of, of a uh, you know, long and, and respectable rabbinic family uh, in Canada. His grandfather on his mother's side uh, was a very learned Torah scholar, uh, his family on his father's side started Char Shemaim, the great celebrated shul in, in Montreal, where they still, to the best of my knowledge, wear uh, morning coats and top hats to, to high holiday services. It's that kind of establishment. Um, and, and Leonard, uh, in, in a weird way, like Stan Lee himself, although from a very different perspective, was interested uh, in, in this fiery energy uh, of, of, of the Hebrew prophets because he was interested in the question of redemption. Uh, in the broken world, is it possible? Uh, what kind of heroic feat uh, must, you, must you perform uh, in order to redeem yourself, and more importantly, those around you, in order to really repair the world? Um, for Stan Lee, uh, in his excitable Bronx kid energetic imagination, it was a question answered by creating all these marvelous, no pun intended, superheroes who literally swooped in and saved the day. For Leonard, uh, it was about trying first uh, poetry, then novels, and, and, and finally music, uh, and, and, and ask questions and, and, and blurt out truths that we all need to hear, like, like the one line uh, from one of his songs that I cite to myself uh, more often than, than I care to admit when, when things seem particularly bleak. Ring the bells that still could ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So I think uh, these two men had more in common than, than they would have uh, liked to admit. Uh, I think they were both each in their own way. Uh, Leonard is an observant Jew. Stanley is a, a person who you know, always downplayed, at least publicly, his Jewish origins, uh, were deeply informed uh, by, by, the, by their Judaism. And, and both have brought me and many, many, many others not just joy, but also, again, the opportunity to engage with that strangest of forces, religion, uh, in, in an earthly and approachable way. That's fascinating. Um, I, I, as long as I have you here, and because you are one of the, really the only expert on gaming that I, I have ever come into contact with in one way or another, and you recently wrote in a piece in, in First Things about how you know, you, uh, there was something particularly Jewish about, about gaming, Explain that to us, um, both for those who grew up playing video games and for those of us who, you know, grew up playing board games. <laughs> well, particularly, I think, you know, Jewish, yes, but also really particularly religious. You know, I, I, started, mm -hmm. uh, I started off my academic career, like so many academics, basically because I didn't want to get a real job, right? Uh, getting into a graduate program seemed like a perfectly respectable way uh, to have the uh, approval and admiration of your parents and peers. Uh, while not having to wear pants for protracted periods of time. Uh, and, and I did this and sort of started playing around with, oh, you know, what, what, should I, what should I explore? And games were always something that I was really interested in. And I started, you know, thinking about them seriously. Uh, and, and asked myself this, you know, kind of similar question that you don't often stop and ask, which is, what is this about? Why do people play games? Why do so many individuals spend so many hours and so many billions of dollars engaging with this particular medium and not another. And, and the sort of uh, answer that, that I sort of slowly got to is because games really have much more in common with religious rites and rituals than they do with anything else. When you play a game, 
you're not engaged in a subjective analytical experience like you are when you're watching TV. You're not sitting on the couch and, you know, consuming some kind of content and then analyzing it, deciding if you like this person or don't like this person, agree with this point of view, reading it as a straightforward, you know, read or, or trying to kind of subvert it in some way and all this great big cultural uh, analysis that, that academics love to perform. When you're playing a game, you're literally and figuratively closing a circuit with a machine, right? You are literally the conductor in the physical sense of, of, of the electrical circuit. Uh, and, and you're performing something that, that uh, both my intuition and later my actual research showed me that is very much akin to being in a kind of trance-like state, like very much like the type of thing that you, when you shut and sort of dove in and go back and forth and, and, and try to ecstatically get into something you're performing uh, these actions, you are uh, taking leave of your of your uh, rational cognitive faculties, and you enter a space that is far more conducive to moral understanding uh, than it is to intellectual understanding. Which is why so many games, at their heart, and I give some examples in in this first things piece uh, that that you refer to, uh, are really not so much about plot or stories, but really about big moments of, of, of moral and ethical decisions that you have to make. The example I give in the piece is this astonishing video game called Papers, Please, that uh, has you play as a border guard in a nondescript totalitarian state, and there are very clear rules about who you can let in and who you can't, and people come in, and at first it's very easy. Good people have their papers in order, and people who look very shady are clearly criminals, and you shouldn't let them in anyway. And then, you know, interesting things start happening, People start coming in, and it's a mother with a, with a starving child. She says, look, if you don't let me in, this baby dies. Uh, and at that point, you understand, if you let her in and are caught, she's a good chance, uh, you will lose money. And if you lose money, some of your family members may suffer or die, or you may lose your job. And then you ask yourself the question, well, what's the purpose of the game? What, what, is, what does it mean to win in this game? Does it mean to follow all of these rules and, and let all these you know, pixelated uh, people suffer? Or does it mean to try to find ways to subvert them and lose the stated object of the game, but actually win morally because this is what we're doing here? I think that that's so fascinating. And that there are so many uh, uh, corners of modern gaming that, that, that make this possible because the medium is conducive to that. Uh, and I think, if nothing else, um, from, from the apathy, uh, uh, stupidity, uh, ignorance, uh, you know, just futility of, of binging on stupid TV... Uh, there will come a great awakening uh, that is predicated on, on gaming and, and not necessarily thinking your way through big moral questions, but really feeling your way through big moral questions. Wow. Well, it is more engaging um, than the passive idea of watching. So there, there's a lot to that. Let me ask you one more question, and that is sort of from your perspective as, as an Israeli. You've been here in America a long time. And, you know, sound like an American, you know, you sound like an American Jew. You know, you don't, you don't sound like an Israeli. Yeah, all right. You'll, you'll do it for me if I ask, right? But what do you still find um, that is sort of off-putting or surprising um, about American Jewish life? And how has that impacted, you know, sort of other Israeli expats who are here and who have sort of evolved as a community in recent years? Wow, man, you really saved <laughs> the most explosive question for last. Um, it's not so much what I find off-putting about American Jews or, or what now being you know, more American Jew than, than, than not what I find off-putting about Israelis. It's that for all of the so-called uh, attempts to connect these two communities and, and for all the energy and, 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 and tens of not hundreds of millions of dollars invested in this relationship, I find that the, that the mutual ignorance uh, is still so profound. I'll give you one example. When I was growing up not too long ago in Israel, uh, I, went, I remember this very clearly. I went to my high school library. This is a really good high school. The library was a serious place. You could get you know, any kind of real great Russian writer you wanted and you know, great French literature and translation and medieval poetry, whatever. And at some point I went in um, and asked, hey, do you have any Jewish writers? Uh, and they said, sure, you know, we have Bialik and we have, you know, Chadam. We have, like, all these great Israeli calls. And I said, no, no, like, 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 do you have any American Jewish writers? And they looked at me like, American Jewish writers? Like, 
they literally had, I think, one book by Saul Bellow, and that was it. Uh, because the idea that there might be something of value uh, about Jewish life anywhere else but the you know, 200 kilometer radius from where we were sitting was simply preposterous. Uh, and I think similarly, a lot of, of American Jews looked at life in Israel like, oh, these are the tough guys who fight in the army and have a tan, but are kind of just like, you know, stubborn jerks. Um, I think both, both nations uh, or both communities ignored uh, at their own peril the tremendous cultural uh, activity that, that took place uh, in the other community. Uh, Israelis reading far too little of, of say, Bella or Malamud uh, than they should, and American Jews paying way less attention to, say, phenomena like Ishai Ribo, the incredible Haredi singer who's now popular in Israel. Uh, I think the key to, to this relationship uh, is, is to really make sure that, that we get to know each other not as, uh, as an abstraction, not as a political entity with, with sort of competing goals, but, but on the basis of our shared tradition, that we both exert a lot of energy and a lot of time, a lot of effort, trying to, to interpret and, and understand and, and grapple with. That's still kind of not happening. Uh, it's happening a little bit more now that you know Israelis uh, export their, their television creations to the world and Americans can sit and watch shows like Shtisel and feel you know, kind of a little bit clued in to, to what goes on in Israel. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. But I think this, this, uh, this, this detente, if you will, this glasnost uh, between Israelis and American Jews is still a very, very, very long way coming. And in a weird way, I mean, mm. I, I feel myself to, to, to sort of very often be the embodiment of, of both these communities. I feel uh, always a little, bit, uh, a little bit too American whenever I'm in Israel or with Israelis and a little bit too Israeli whenever I'm with American Jews. Uh, and, and I think this sense of, of discomfort that I feel is, is precisely the sense of discomfort that, that, that I want to share with others, because I think it's exactly what we need to resolve to build a real relationship and not one predicated on politics. That's an important insight. Thank you. Well, Liel, thank you so much for joining us on Top Story today. You've given us a lot to chew on. Um, and thank you to the audience for tuning in again. Uh, please like, subscribe, uh, give us good reviews wherever you listen to uh, podcasts, whether it's Apple, Amazon, Google, SoundCloud, you name it, um, or Spotify. And also, if you're watching it on uh, YouTube, on the JNS YouTube channel, um, we look forward to having you back next week. And thanks again for tuning in. Jonathan, it has been such a pleasure, and thank you so much for everything that you do. I have no idea how you do everything that you do, because you seem to write, you know, <laughs> seven times a day these incredibly insightful, analytical, beautiful pieces. But I'm, I'm grateful for everything, and I'm so happy to have been a guest on the show. Well, thank you. That's, um, that's very kind of you to say. And uh, thank you for what you do and for what you write. Um, and thanks for coming on. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode brought to you by the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. Visit us at JNS.org and please follow at Amazon and Spotify wherever you listen to podcasts.